good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to see so many folks in the in the attendee here. Um, I'm Naomi Slip, the Douglas and Cynthia Crocker Endowed Chair for the Chief Curator at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And uh, it's my honor to uh, launch the first Sailor Series Lecture of 2022 and introduce our speaker this evening. The Sailor Series is an annual legacy lecture series of the New Bedford Whaling Museum that presents a wide variety of experiences and adventures by individuals with lifelong commitments to sailing boats and the sea. It's supported by Ruth and Hope Atkinson and also in part by the Samuel D. Rositsky Lecture Fund. This evening, uh, we are very pleased to welcome Captain and Director for the National Historic Park and Landmark Schooner, Ernestina Morrissey, uh, Captain Tiffany Crewan. Captain Tiffany Crewan has more than 25 years of experience in the maritime industry. Her areas of expertise are in maintaining and sailing traditionally rigged sailing vessels and inspiring learners of all ages through experiences with these great ships. She currently holds her 500 GRT master's license with sail and ocean endorsement and has her international 3000 GT master's. Tiffany received the Sail Trainer of the Year Award from Tall Ships America in 2019 and joined Mass Maritime Academy in March of 2021, where she is overseeing the final stages of the restoration of the historic schooner Ernestina Morrissey. The Ernestina Morrissey's much anticipated relaunch is planned for the summer of 2022, and we're thrilled to be able to welcome it to New Bedford during that period. Um, so please uh, join me in, in welcoming Tiffany. We look forward to uh, her presentation. Yes, very exciting. I'm up here in Maine right now. Uh, we're making some decisions on uh, different systems that are going into the vessel where placements for panels and that. So I've been busy this week. Um, uh, first, I'm just going to say I'm probably one of the least qualified people to talk about the history of the Ernestina Morrissey. So uh, um, there are so many people probably here at this webinar that and from New Bedford that probably have a much better idea. I'm still learning. Um, I read a lot of technical manuals right now and not so much uh, great books like Phoenix of the Sea, this one here, all about Ernestina. Um, one of my favorite things about her is just the amount of history that is on her, how many people have uh, encountered people that have sailed on her, how many books are out there about their experiences. Um, uh, the, the group, uh, SEMA all these years, even though the vessel hasn't been sailing, how they've kept the archives going. And then at the Bridgewater, they also have the archives. And um, even at uh, MIT, they had some uh, drawings that were done of her of the 70s to get historically accurate, to compare what she came into from when she was uh, over in Cape Verde and the way she was when she was launched. So I'm, I'm really impressed and feel very honored to be her next captain. Also, I'm very excited not to be her first female captain, that there have been people ahead of me, and I'm looking forward to the day where that's no longer a big deal, such as also like the new commander of the Constitution. So it's, it's wonderful that we're getting there, but the day will really be a great day when it's no big deal that you're just known as a captain, not a female captain or whatever else the case may be. Um, so I'm just going to go briefly. I have a little PowerPoint. Um, and I'm going to finish up. People always want to know how I ended up being a captain. And so we're going to talk about that, too. So it's going to blend into a little history. I can talk a lot more about the restoration of her. Um, and then just, again, how I ended up with this really amazing job um, that I had no idea that I could do when I was young. I'm going to remove my video when you make your PowerPoint live, but I will jump in. If anyone on the, the webinar has questions, type them into the chat. Uh, Tiffany's offered to do this conversationally, so I'll share them as we go. All right. So um, again, I work for Massachusetts Maritime Academy, and Ernestina is the state ship of the Commonwealth and MMAs, we call it MMA, uh, Mobile Ambassador. So if you're not familiar, I'm not going to read this all for you, but, you know, Ernestina and her uh, one ship, many lives, um, trying to get ready for this, this talk. I, I've read a lot. Uh, it was a really good um, exercise for me to get caught up on her history, but she really has had an amazing history from when she was launched in 1894 as a 
Effie uh, Morrissey and then fishing the, the roughly 20 years. And then uh, once Captain Bob Bartlett, uh, while well, she was doing coastal um, trade and that uh, along New the Canadian coasts and then for Arctic exploration with Captain Bob Bartlett. Um, she's, it's really hard to believe that, that this vessel is still out there sailing and will be again soon. Uh, with any luck this summer, she'll be back in the area. Um, when she was launched, she launched on February 1st. So she just had a birthday, uh, 128 years old. Uh, some of my favorite things that just the cost uh, compared to in the time. So when she was launched, it cost $6,700 and it only took four months. I'll get to a slide that compares it. Her, num her stats are pretty much still the same. They haven't changed. Um, if anything, she's closer to what she originally was like when she was launched back in 1894. Um, during my research for this talk, I was <clears throat> getting together all the uh, different what's going on? Uh, captains and owners. Um, I haven't finished it because it's, again, 128 years worth of history. I'd like to try and document as much as possible. Um, but I did a little timeline as well. I'm going to jump in here, Tiffany. I think we're seeing you, but not the slides. Oh, no. Oh. So it'll make sure we're... Oh, buggers. Okay. It's always the tricky bit. Right? <laughs> but it's um, great to have this uh, sense of the history that you're describing. Oh, no. Let's see. There is a very good reason I drive a boat from 150 years ago. <laughs> or 100, in this case, 128 years ago. There. Perfect. Okay. All right, I'm going to go away now. <laughs> okay. I'm so glad you said something. It feels really weird. I'm used to doing these kind of conversations and talks in person. So right now I'm just looking at my own screen pretending that there's somebody on the other side of it. Hopefully there are. Um, but again, just getting ready for this, uh, I found some really great information, things I didn't know, um, that actually, that Captain Bartlett's cousin actually brought her to uh, Canada and sailed her doing kind of coastal trade. And then the, the years that he had for getting her ready for the exploration up into the Arctic, and how many times they went and all the different funders for all these different explorations. Um, one of my favorite things is that she did uh, all of that until 1926 under just sail. She got a powered in 1926 to do the trips up north and as an assistant and we call it an auxiliary sailing vessel. So the engine was still not the main way of propulsion. The sails were. Um, I can see why the government hired them to take supplies up and, and do some more uh, exploration of the area because all those trips up there they that uh, they've just had must have a, a, an amazing amount of knowledge of the area. Um, she was going to go. She, I guess she wasn't. Um, oh, buggers. Um, also went to Alaska up to the Bering Straits to find out a theory whether or not there was a land bridge that uh, crossed over. Um, so again, all over the place. Um, but then after Cab B Captain Bartlett died, uh, the vessel was sold to two people that wanted to uh, turn her into a trade vessel, coastal, not coastal trade, but island trade vessel in the South Pacific and on their way out, on their way on the journey, I'm not sure how far they got. Uh, you know, they found out that she really wasn't as seaworthy as they needed her to be. And so they abandoned that and brought her back. And then she mysteriously had a fire. Um, and I say mysteriously, cause it is unknown origin of fire in the galley that eventually they just filled her up with so much water trying to put out the fire that she sank. And then she was raised up, and then um, then that starts her 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 uh, packet schooner time for Cape Bird getting the uh, you know I think it took them about a year to get her ready. And one of my favorite things about this part is they took out the engine, even though 
she had an engine may have, may not have been able to work anymore after the fire I'm not sure the case but they did that uh, that back and forth between the Cape Bird and the U.S. all these times you can see I have it kind of outfitted or outlined here until uh, I forget which year right now but they did eventually put power in her um, they eventually did put power in her, oh there it is in 1954 repowered her with an 80 horsepower diesel that was because they got caught up off of in a hurricane off of Nantucket and they didn't have a VHF marine radio so they added those two things um, We've had a question come in that relates to the timeline here, which yeah. is, um, are there a complete set of log books? Um, how do we kind of know about the, these various journeys, the trips? Um, sure. So uh, my, I don't know if there are any log books. If there are, I'm sure they're probably at Bridgewater um, being well taken care of. I imagine, especially with you being a curator, you understand what a log and, and stuff like that have. My research came from the Ernestina.org website, which is outstanding, especially if you go to pre the, the, the archived one. And then again, um, the Phoenix of the Sea was a really great book about it. And I also read uh, Bringing E Home. It's more of a someone's journal about bringing the Ernestina back to the States. And um, also an Arctic rodeo. Uh, they actually had a cowboy on board at one point to wrangle a, a bear, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, so that's where my research came from. And I'd like to continue that and just try and get all the needs of as many as I can anyway of everybody that's ever captained Ernestina Morrissey. And I think that answered the question. So here's some pictures. Um, these are all just available online at different sources. A lot of them from Ernestina.org. Um, but I love this, this one over here with all the, the schooners in port, either offloading or prepping to go back out. And then the dorymen trailing behind when they were doing the lock binding for cod and that. Here they are up in the Arctic. Um, this picture in the upper right, uh, that one kind of makes my heart skip a little bit. That's, that's quite a heel on a boat with the washing of the deck uh, between the shrouds. With uh, any luck, we'll get her back up to the Arctic. It'd be a fun experience to get her up to the Arctic with Bowdoin. Bowdoin from Maine Maritime Academy uh, also has a lot of uh, history in in being up in the Arctic. Um, here she is painted white. I believe this is just before uh, she sank, before she went to the uh, South, or intended to go to the South Pacific. Um, I think she looks much better black hauled. And here she is on the Cape Bird Money. Um, that's really fascinating that this boat has such an important tie to them, how many people they brought back and forth as immigrants to the United States or back to Cape Bird, um, reading some of the information, you know, anywhere from 25 day journey to 40 day journey, I think back and forth on a, on a vessel that was sailing for a good portion of that time. Oops, oh, goodness. sorry about, there we go. So here's uh, two pictures of during her restoration um, from the same angle. The one on the right is before all the framing's been replaced and uh, the planking's back on. She did go through a restoration, a refit, I think in 2008, if I remember correctly. So up forward on the bow, um, that wasn't changed from that restoration, but everything from what we call the break of the deck aft uh, was new. So you can see all those new timbers and deck beams. And then here she is, Right after I started, I took this picture and she's changed quite, quite a bit since then. We're starting to get more furniture. We call it furniture on board, um, laying out more things that will be permanent. So here, here's another picture. Um, 
you can see her stern uh, over on the left um, needed a little bit of work. You can see right through it. That's never good. And the middle picture is when they're putting in the last plank on the stern. Um, pretty impressive. And then over all the way on the right, I can't see it because of my screen, but hopefully everybody can just how beautiful that's their workmanship. The Bristol shipyard is doing an amazing job. Their craftsmanship is outstanding. And now we're moving on to systems installation. And again, the work has just been fabulous. Here's some more pictures. Um, the windlass before it was taken off and then during the middle of its restoration. And now it's back in. I think that's just primer on it. So she's gonna look the same when, so we'll get that all painted to make her look the same. Here's one of the, at the bottom left is her old propeller in that opening where the propeller spins just forward of the rudder post and rudder, that's called the aperture. Two neat facts about it. So you can see how squared off it is uh, before the rebuild. And then after the rebuild, it's more, more shaped, oval shaped. Uh, so more, more material around that, the deadwood there. And, and then the finished, and now they're putting the propeller in. Um, but the thing that I also, the second fact is um, if I can stand up in that aperture and I'm 5'2 and still reach up above my head. So just to give you an idea of uh, height of everything, it's it, when you see a picture like this, it's just like taking a picture of a wave. It's so hard to capture just how big that wave is. But again, it, it, this part, I can stand up and stretch my hands above me. So probably about six feet. Here's some beautiful pictures of her in company with Pride of Baltimore too and some other little schooner. Um, I'm not sure which year this was taken. I'm sure somebody like Marianne McQuillan or Fred, they know where it was and when it was. Um, here she is with her main gaff topsail. All right. So the stuff I know more about, <laughs> my background and how I became her captain. Um, Let's see. There's a little slideshow that goes with it. If my finger. Okay, so um, I started out uh, on stink boats. Some people will call them power vessels. Um, I like to call myself binautical. And just fun fact, I'm dating somebody who's uh, sail curious. Um, just because I like all boats. Uh, any boat out there, I I can see its lines and want to go out for a ride. And kind of tell how it's going to ride but these pictures here are not of my grandfather's vessel but the exact same model so he would take us grandkids out for weekends brave man there was the three of us back then um and tool all over the great lakes but the yacht club where he kept his vessel had a sailing program a junior sailing program called the rayburn sailing school it was more of more of an actual school than a camp. It, it, it took place all summer long, but most every single day of the week, it was a great way to get the, as I'm sure my mom loved it, got us kids out of the house. And, um, but my grandfather's perspective was to give us some water safety experience. So that was his, his intent for us to take these courses. And uh, for me, it just stuck. I just fell in love with sailing at the age of 10. And I just, I haven't stopped since then. Uh, my other, my siblings know how to sail too, but um, it's just I'm I don't know when last time they I guess with me, um, and so about age thirteen I started racing sailboats, um, FJs which have now been replaced by four twenties, and um, that upper left Ferguson vessel, um, very fun to sail. I did a lot of work on. J24s, they like to keep this nice, small, light person up forward for changing out sails or helping set the spinnaker. Um, so I did a lot of that. And at the peak of my sailing career, racing, racing career, um, I was racing lightnings, made it to North American Championship for women. Um, I don't remember what I've ever placed, but I 
I, I do remember capsizing once and it's not really a boat you capsize very much, but every single boat capsized, a, a squall came up. We were outside Toronto and uh, knocked us all over. So that was a, a fun moment. So then um, how I got into tall ships. Uh, so I got my captain's license 25 years ago because when I was in college, studying environmental science biology. I uh, was this instructor at the Rayburn Sailing School teaching sailing. And I found uh, from that experience, I really enjoyed teaching sailing. And so I got my captain's license so I could teach sailing on keel boats. Uh, technically, if you're on a vessel that has a motor, you have to have a captain's license to, to take people out because they're, they're paying for that sailing lesson. and Technically, that would then be a charter in the eyes of the Coast Guard. So that's the reason I got my license 25 years ago. But then uh, after I had my license, uh, this ship, Appledore 4, came to Erie, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. And my grandfather went down and talked to the captain and found out that they needed a mate who had sailing experience. And I already had my license. So my grandfather helped me get that job. And I went down and I... I'm not even sure I ever said yes to the employment, but within 10 minutes of being on board the vessel, Captain Mick, he had me all the way at the top of the main mast to take care of something. Um, Cause I'm, again, I'm fairly small and he was a nice, huge man, like a football player and just pulled me straight up. And I didn't know if I was afraid of heights at that point. Um, I'm not, but it was a good experience. So sailed on her and I actually eventually became relief captain on, on this vessel. Your first vessel is always, always is like really special vessel. So when I see her out sailing still, um, makes me really happy. So then I've sailed on, over on the uh, left is Letty G. Howard, um, one year older than Ernestina Morrissey, uh, the same, same styles, uh, of a fishing schooner. Um, she's in the Great Lakes right now, but runs out of uh, South, Street, South Street Seaport Museum. Over on the right is the Dennis Sullivan. Um, I've spent a lot of time on that vessel. I consider that I, I professionally grew up on that vessel. I started sailing her as a deckhand the first year of operation and kept coming back to it over and over again, working my way up the rank. Um, so I'm what they call a Haas Piper. I've worked my way up and I've done all my certifications at uh, different maritime schools or directly with the Coast Guard. Uh, so she also has a special place in my heart. They all do, quite honestly. The Brig Niagara from my hometown, Erie, Pennsylvania, she's an amazing sailing vessel. I actually never professionally sailed on her. I just volunteered, um, but it was a really great experience. XC Johnson. Um, there's two twin brigantines out of San Pedro, California, which is just outside LA. Um, so I most of my time was on XC Johnson vessel, but I was on the Irving as well a little bit. Captain XC a few times. Uh, if you're ever curious, between they literally are twin ships. XC has a red stripe on her. And then Irving has the blue stripe. So in case there's anybody that was wondering that. Um, also, I was chief mate on Pride of Baltimore too. Uh, it's so funny to think about like, oh, it feels like it was only maybe, you know, eight years ago and it was back in 2006. So time flies. We've got a question coming in. How many women in these crews, American versus international? What was the composition like on these different vessels? Yeah, um, you know, at the from mate position on down, it's really split 50 50. Um, but then at that captain position, it's still not as high when it comes to female captains, but it is in the tall ship world getting much better. It's probably the most progressive side of the maritime industry. Um, I'm happy to report uh, it, it'll be coming out um, soon, I hope. Of, but we've hired a chief mate, for a full-time chief mate for Ernestina Morrissey. 
and it's another female. So we have uh, two females in charge of Ernestina Morrissey, and uh, hopefully the the engineer will be as well. I'm not sure where that that employment uh, hire is, but we're still looking working on that one. Um, but in the maritime industry as a whole, you know, women are still aren't that high, especially like in the tug industry. Your cruise ships uh, are getting better, but having women, the military is getting much better, obviously, about having women at those higher ranks. But just like so many other kind of male dominated industries, it's slow going. And like I said uh, earlier, hopefully someday we'll be at a point where being a female captain or whatever else is not a big deal. Um, so, uh, Why do you oh. think it is that tall ships um, are a space that has been the first to kind of um, break open and accept female um, captains? Um, I'd have to say just tall ships and you know, everybody who ever works on them are pretty liberal people. Um, they're, they're very much live and let live, um, very accepting. Um, you know, when you live that close with people all the time, they end up becoming family. And unlike some other vessels and other uh, industries, we're usually living together for the whole season. Um, so you really get to know everyone. And I think the camaraderie on our ships are, is really high. I've definitely had experiences where the end of the season, we all hate each other. Uh, but I think that's why we're just really accepting because we know we have to live in tight situations. Um, and again, it's really accepting uh, as, a, as an out lesbian in the maritime industry. I've never had any problems with that either. So again, it's just a very accepting industry, a side of the industry. Sophie Morris notes in the comments, so great to hear it, that Ernestina is still leading the pack with women leadership. Agreed about hoping for a day when it's not huge. Yep, definitely looking forward to that day. Um, over on the right, excuse me, the left, boy, I'm all, over on my port side uh, is Roseway, Captain her for a little bit back again years ago. Uh, and uh, I was on this vessel on the right, my starboard side here, uh, is STV Unicorn. It was an all-female crew for all female students, which we actually did do male programs. It was just never together. Uh, it was just mainly all-female students, but we always reserved one week a year to take out a whole bunch of high school boys out that was always fun. It was at the end of the season, it was a good uh, comic relief for us. Um, them daring each other to run around in their boxers, stuff like that, stuff that young men like to do. I, we did have one, the owner of the vessel, uh, Jay Santa Maria, he had to come along each year. So we had at least one adult male representative to help wrangle in these young men. I we had, had a. a Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, oh. aside from a uh, teenage boy wrangling, there is a question from Catherine Hunter about other skills that you may need um, to crew on a tall ship. So the question is, are you given training in sail repair? Is such training unnecessary? How many extra sails are carried? Um, when it comes to extra sails, we usually don't carry the extra sails on board, but we do carry material for substantial repairs. So panels. Um, and just like so many things, you kind of learn as you go. There's going to be somebody on board that knows how to sew the sail properly and they'll teach you. Um, I'm only actually one person removed from somebody teaching another sailor by Irving Johnson. And Irving Johnson is one of like the leaders of the movement of tall ships and education. Um, so, you know, this person learned how to sew a sail from Irving Johnson. And then this person taught me how to set, sew a sail. So, but also, um, you know, I didn't know anything about engines before, uh, before my experience starting on tall ships, but they're always breaking down at the worst time. So I'm really good at what I say is a common sense diesel engine. It's a very simple machine. Um, it, you can diagnose it pretty easily. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, the new engine in Ernestina Morrissey is top tier environmentally friendly, which is fabulous, but it's all computerized. 
So I just look at it. It's shiny, it's white, it's new, and I just will know the tech really well. Um, same with our generators. So it's great that they're making these engines so much more environmental friendly, um, but it is making it harder for us average people, us mere mortals to work on them. Um, so those are skills that I've just developed, just about everything I've just developed during my time on board asking questions. So very long answer to a short question. Um, so yep, there's unicorn. Uh, yep, lots of fun. Learned a lot on that vessel. Um, it just, there are more vessels that I've sailed on, but here's Appledore number five uh, in the Great Lakes. I would do relief work for them. And then I had the horrible idea a few years ago, back in 2000, the end of 2019, to purchase and restore my own mini wooden tall ship, uh, Tahiti Catch. It turned out to be a great save year because during the shutdown and pandemic, that's what I got to work on with my daughter. We literally would go up, she was 80 miles away and stay on her, even though she was on the hard and work on her all, all summer long. And then everybody would just kind of like gather around drinking their beer saying, you're never going to get this done. And I had her in the water by the end of July and had her engine finally going by the end of August. So. Um, she hadn't been in the water in over 20 years, but it took a lot of dedication. So if one, one positive thing for me, at least with the pandemic, is my vessel, my beloved little Tahiti catch, is quite in the way, far, far along in her restoration. Wow. So here's a, a picture of a Great Lakes cargo schooner. So if you want to know history about Great Lakes cargo schooners, I can tell you about that from doing working on them for more than a dozen years. But uh, one of my dear friends, Chris Winters, put together a book all about the, the Dennis Sullivan, my last vessel. And one day we wanted to recreate this picture. This picture is like around the turn of the century. Uh, they were lumber haulers. And so my crew did that. So you can see pretty much the same, I'm sure, sure same mindset living outside all the time working with your hands in the environment kind of gives you that same edge. I think that's it. Uh, here's just some of my resources for uh, what I put together for this talk today. Um, so if anybody wants any more information, they can find that. Um, you can always reach out to me as well uh, at the Maritime Academy. I'm not sure right on schedule wow so that's pretty much all i have great well i'd love to know a little bit about what the the kind of major differences are with uh captaining some of the various vessels that you've worked on over your career um the difference between them mm -hmm. yeah so uh you know each vessel sails here i can stop sharing here we go um, each vessel has its own characteristic of, it, not to get too hokey, but it has its own soul, as it were, has its own way of doing things. Um, and some, some, some vessels kind of teach you really early on what they can and can't do. And some, some are stubborn. Um, I didn't really feel like I really had a great grip on the Dennis Sullivan until like four or five years ago. So you're talking about six, seven years where I was still worried about what was gonna happen. Um, she was tricky about certain conditions. You wouldn't think so because she's a twin screw vessel, meaning two propellers on either side. Sometimes it actually complicated it where a single screw, you, it's almost always the same. It's very different for it to be uh, not the same between boats. But twin, if you have two propellers, it, depending on how close or how far apart or how further down they are, can really change a lot of the aqua dynamics of the vessel, so. We've got a question from Gil Shapiro about um, the processes of restoration. So is there a difference in restoration of the hull between saltwater and the Great Lakes? Actually, uh, yeah, 
a vessel in the Great Lakes, you need to do a lot more maintenance on, which sounds surprising. Everybody's always really surprised. So we actually, in the Great Lakes, we would salt the vessel. We'd put big salt blocks in the bilges and salt down her deck. And then the off season, we would spray borax in all those places, which is a derivative of salt, um, just to help preserve the wood. So just like what salt does to us, you know, makes us retain water, preserves, uh, it does that to the wood as well. So that's why you never hear of a hundred year old wooden vessel from the Great Lakes. It's just sweet water. That's what they call it. Sweet water is just not good for wooden vessels. Um, so there is a, a, a big difference uh, on how you maintain them. So her being here in the, in the ocean will be really good for her. Are there similar kind of um, preservation techniques though that you have to undertake for um, vessels here? Um, well, one thing you wanna make sure you just, you're not in an area where worms are really bad, even though you have your bottom paint on, you just wanna be real cautious of that, that, you know, the spots where your bottom paint's getting rubbed off right at that water line here, where you might be touching the dock or your fenders keep rubbing on the wall. You just wanna really watch those for worms. Um, other than that, I, don't, I can't think of too many of things when it comes to salt water versus fresh water maintenance. All right, we've got some thank yous coming in for presentations for our uh, attendees here on the webinar. This is your moment to ask questions of Captain Crewan. Uh, so glad to hear you talk about boat souls. Ernestina has had such a strong one over the years. People talk about it a lot. Can you talk about what it's what it's like taking over or becoming captain of a vessel that has such a kind of deep history and so many people really feel connected to it and its legacy? Yeah, she's definitely the people's boat for sure. Um, I love hearing everybody's stories. Uh, just like any anything, she's going to put me in my place when I try and ask something of her that uh, is not a good idea. Um, that's that's true for a lot of boats, but with all the wisdom of the people that know this vessel um, and all the people that have seen her throughout the years, hearing their stories um, and how they're tied to the vessel. You noted that you're hoping to take her um, north with Bowdoin. Are there other kind of future plans beyond her summer unveiling that you're kind of thinking about or hoping? Yeah, our hope is to get her over in Cape Bard for their 50th anniversary of independence. So that's uh, 25. So I think once once we get the boat done, we'll start thinking about other things like that. But starting the financial campaign, get the funds together to have her there for that. But that's also kind of tied into, I believe it's the United States. Um, I'm not even sure what sequentennial, I don't know, uh, the 250th as well as happening right. right about then too. So we'd really be pulled to be there maybe early in the season and be back here in the States because there are already, a lot of cities are already planning big events for that, so. Mm -hmm. Right, so that'll be 2025 and then into 2026 you're yeah. describing, yeah. So there's also a question here about what's happening this summer. Will she sail? <laughs> Will you share? <sighs> Um, I, I wish I wish I had a crystal ball and I could tell you that information because it's probably the number one question I get asked multiple times a day from all sorts of people. Even I went got my hair cut today and the, and the woman asked me when is the boat launching? I don't know. Um, you know, pre-pandemic things were normal. It's definitely not normal time. And now what's happening over in Eastern Europe as well. It's going to have an effect on on everyone, um, so I I maybe we should start a pool. I don't know, <laughs> but the hope is she'll be here in New Bedford in the summertime. Yes, ready, that is ready to premiere. Yes, yeah. that is our intent. We already know we're one month behind. Um, I'm sure it's going to be two months behind, but mm -hmm. our, our we're bringing the crew on next month and starting to get ready. So it, it's, it, it is happening. Mm -hmm. 
That's very exciting. We've got a wonderful personal connection here in the chat. David Moretti notes, my great grandmother was Ida Serena Morrissey Malone and Effie and Clayton Morrissey's sister. And William Morrissey was my great, great grandfather. Do you see opportunities for the public to be able to go on a sale? It has been a lifetime goal of mine. Yes, definitely. Um, with her new certification, once we once she's complete and we pass um, our stability and our Coast Guard, she'll be able to take out passengers for day sale. So the intent is, so she has three jobs that she's going to do once she's uh, back in Massachusetts. First and foremost uh, is for Massachusetts Maritime Academy, getting their cadets and their programming aboard. And then it through state legislation, she is mandated to continue doing environmental ed or doing educational programming with students in the New Bedford area and open to the public. So I, I imagine, I'm pretty sure we'll have uh, very special um, sales where people can purchase tickets to go out for like maybe a two hour sale, something like that. I don't believe she was able to do that towards the end of her sailing career back in 2003. I think she was just taking out, sailing out as a, what we call an R boat, which is a school ship. So She's a small passenger vessel and a school ship. So I hope Fantastic. that answers your, and makes your goal. I can imagine that that will fulfill uh, the dreams of a lot of community members. Yeah. Wonderful. Are there more questions we have here? What's the third role? Oh, well, the, fir the public sailing. So first role mm -hmm. is Massachusetts Maritime Academy. Second role, educational programming for the youth in the New Bedford area and third roles being available to people for day sales or tours and that sort of thing. Um, right. Especially with her, her statue of part of the national park there. Will she continue her connection with the Cape Verdean community? I don't think she couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, um, I mean, people have explained it to me that she's their Mayflower you know, mm -hmm. bringing people across. So uh, I think her tie there is very strong. Um, I mean, Canadians have a, a strong tie to her too, because she was up in Newfoundland for all that time. And Can you talk about what the preparations are like as you start to onboard your crew? What does that mean, getting them ready to, to take her out? Yeah, so the crew will show up and they will assist the yard on finishing the vessel. Um, some things like painting her that one last time. Um, she looks great right now, but she needs definitely another coat. You know, paint is one of the most important parts of the vessel when it comes to maintenance. You want to make sure that paint stays really well and you're doing it at a, a really good job to make sure it's staying on. Um, the engineer will help with like the installation and completion of the AC and DC system. So she has both DC, like your car, you know, off of a battery. And then she has two generators. So she has AC like your house. Um, so that person will be helping with that. Uh, she has a whole new rig, her spars are all new. Um, so the crew will be helping the master rigger uprig the new spars and bend on the sails. Um, all those other things where many hands make light work. Uh, one of the big changes in her from what prior to the restoration is all of her ballast was internal. And so I would say roughly 60% of her ballast now is external. Um, it was melted down and it's in this kind of cubic form bolted to the bottom of the vessel making up part of her keel. So that other 40% of ton, of, I forget how many tons it is right now, has to go back in the boat and they weigh, I think about 60 pounds each, those lead agates. So that's definitely going to be one of the jobs that crew are going to do. Your crew uh, will get a workout. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have really strong arms uh, after this. And then there's just so many things to get ready. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a brand new galley. So the cook's going to be busy. I mean, we have the stove and we'll have uh, built-in refrigeration systems, but then everything else, you know, mm -hmm. outfitting. Where, where are we going to put things? What makes sense? Um, so there's a lot for our crew to do. You said that some of the ballast was melted down and mounted on the outside. Is that unusual? Why, why make that choice? Um, I, I don't know why they made that choice other than it does free up a bunch of area below what the floor in a boat's called the sole. 
um, free up a lot of area. Plus, if you think about it, a vessel is like a pendulum. And so if you can get that counterweight lower, uh, the vessel's more stable in theory. Um, I believe that was the reasoning behind it. Uh, and then the rest of the, the, the ballast will be what for used for what's called trim. So there's a little bit of a guess how she's gonna sit once she's back in the water. And we might have to, we might find we need a lot more lead up forward now than what used to be there. So it'll be real interesting to see how that, how she works out to trim her out. Well, it's exciting. It's a lot to look forward to. Do we have more questions from attendees here? <laughs> oh, we've got, um, Best fortune from Schooner Adventurous Community in Puget Sound. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> know that boat very well, Port Townsend. Hmm. Well, I think we're, we're coming up on the top of our hour here. I'll give it a minute for anyone else to drop in comments or, or notes um, for Tiffany on this fantastic presentation and lovely conversation. Um, I think everyone is... Uh, primed and ready for you to to hit the harbor <laughs> uh so am i it's been a long two years of captaining a desk <laughs> i have um i call it desk fatigue my the dean of the massachusetts maritime academy walks by and he says i just feel so bad for you i'm not somebody you intended to sit i'm a very motion driven person i like to be outside and, and moving and physical so you're ready I'm beyond ready. <laughs> I'm so actually <laughs> duct tape myself to this chair just so I sit here. <laughs> Sophie Moore says, thank you so much. Great to meet you. Hope I can make it back to New England to step on board her again. So I think many of our attendees this evening hold uh, strong connections to, uh, to um, this historic vessel. And it will be really wonderful to see her in the water again. She's definitely the people's vessel for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've maybe reached the end here of our program and conversation. Um, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Captain Crew One, and thank you to everyone in attendance for joining us for this wonderful inaugural Sailors Series Lecture of 2022. Um, we hope you'll join us again for future programming. Bye, thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Marianne McQuillan says thank you. <laughs> Marino, thank you. <laughs>